Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to episode number six of Refactoring an Android App with our friend Rakesh. Hello Rakesh, how are you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? Doing just fine. Guys, it's been about 10 days since we released the video and we just want to say we're sorry about that, but uh, you know, we have day jobs and those take time. They are uh, they're day jobs. <laughs> so about the frequency of making more videos, we're, we're working on it, but expect one video per week. If time permits, given these jobs, we will release another video or we might just release two consecutively if we record them back to back. So that's about the frequency of videos. Uh, in the last episode, actually, oh, before we get to that, about the viewers, uh, we want to thank you again for participating in the comments section, telling us what you think, asking questions, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but the issue is, uh, some people request videos to be more beginner friendly. Mm, well, these these videos are more targeted towards intermediate developers because they are actually um, targeted towards my type of developer, the developers at my level as opposed to developers that have not heard yet of anything called Reactive Java, that have not heard yet of anything called Model View Presenter. These are the really beginner developers, and that's fine, but there's tons of videos out there that target this kind of audience. What we're trying to do is target the intermediate level de developers. So if you're out there, you're watching our videos, you think you're an expert, we think you're an intermediate. <laughs> I classify myself as an intermediate developer, by no means an expert. Nor is nor would uh, Rakesh call himself an expert, but you know what no. we mean, yeah. So absolutely, uh, yeah. Uh, so that's the target audience. There's tons of videos. Just keep on it, keep trying, and then come back if there's anything unclear, or if there's something a little unclear somewhere you didn't understand something, feel free to just go right ahead and ask in the comments. Rakesh is more than answering questions. And that's it. Well, yeah. And can I just add, though, that the reason um, I started doing these videos with you was because you were in a situation that I found myself in very, you know, many times. And also, I think a lot of other people are in that they, they've worked with Android for a bit and they've got something working, mm -hmm. but they want to like, you know, well, hold on. It works, but, you know, I know it's not the greatest way to design this system. Um, this software architecture, you know, how do, how do I change it to become more maintainable? How can I start introducing tests because you've had issues with testing? So, you know, and that sort of stuff isn't really... That's not intuitive, yeah. Right? You need some guidance. I mean, there's plenty of examples of, you know, here's my app with MVP in it, right? But it, mm. they didn't show you how they got to it, right? Yeah. Or there's plenty of videos with MVP from scratch starting building an app from scratch. But what we wanted to do was take an existing app that worked and introduce MVP into it and yeah. testing as well. So we'd, we're trying to get that sort of a niche. So it's not going to be for like, you know, you know, the guy who just got out of college who's never worked on a software project before. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be for, you know, people who have been, who know Android. You uh, know? I, I would say, don't, yeah. Don't, yeah. I would say yeah. three, three or 2.5 years of experience with mm. Android. As long as, as long as you know, the Android stuff isn't the issue. I mean, we have we've hardly even talked about Android. Yeah, that's videos. true. It's, it's basically all Java. been about general software principles, how to do testing, and you know, the stuff that we introduced was like Makito, uh, JUnit, stuff like that. So it's more like you know, it's about the way you s write software. It's not specific to Android. But obviously, we're gonna we you know we live in that world, mm. but you know, you're not learning new Android from us here. Right, we haven't introduced any new Android things. What we're saying is how to divide up your code in a different way, and that you know that helps you to write better code. That helps you to look after your code. Yeah, and help you to, right. So about the last time, uh, we had an issue with the IDE not providing hints so that we could replace our existing anonymous inner classes with RX. Was that the issue? That was the issue. No. Uh, not with Rx, with lambdas. With lambdas, with lambdas, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, so yeah. we fixed that as per as per two okay, things. So Already, Rakesh figured it out, and some uh, user commented on how it's done. So let's see that. Yeah. 
you've got to you've got to tell the Android plugin that you're uh, compiling against version one point eight, and then it does its magic and you know whatever makes it work on Android. Okay, that's great. But I remember <clears throat> that moving to Java eight and being able to use lambdas and Jack and Jill was because of that annotation. Sat an annotation because of that line. No, there's there's a line missing. You need another line that says use Jack true or something. Okay. Which but we haven't got. But this doesn't say that I'm... It, it, this is like the target SDK versus the compile SDK, right? This is target and source. Source. So neither of those says that I want to... I want to enforce Java 8 on my current code so that whatever is uh, valid uh, now with it does? Well, it does, except that... Well, you know what? <laughs> I'm not 100% sure how it works. All I can tell you, though, is you need that there, and Retro Lambda mm. will then kick in because it's a plugin as well. Mm. But I do know, for example, you don't have streams available, which is in Java 8. There you go. So you do not have Java APIs, the 8 APIs yet. Yeah, okay. you don't have all of them. Okay. Um, and interestingly, my new job, they use a, a lightweight a lightweight streams library. So um, as a uh, backport. Yes. So it's a backport, and um, if I if I um, think it's any good, I might we might cover that as well. See how it goes. Yeah. First, we're gonna have to understand what streams are. <laughs> yes, of course. You know. Um, so yeah. So that but fixes anyway, this it. That was the fix. Now, if we go back to our presenter, the ID is now telling us that we can do this. So we can do this, right? Oh, very nice. So this this is syntactic sugar, or like? Oh, it's complicated, right? So on Java eight, on the real Java eight, mm. JDK, obviously they changed the um, the infrastructure to support lambdas natively. Right? Yeah. And under the hood with the byte codes and whatever, whatever, there's something native there that deals with lambdas properly and it's all brilliant. But okay. if you're okay. running on an old JDK, right, you haven't got that. So I think it is syntactic sugar. And what Retro Lambda is actually doing is it's allowing us to write it in this style, mm. but it's actually turning it back into an anonymous class inside the bytecode. No, like that's what I thought before. I think so as well. I'm not an expert on these things, and maybe somebody who's watching could, you know, tell us differently. But as you can see, it really cut back on the code, didn't it? Yeah, cut exactly. On, like, There's also um, a function here. Uh, it's project scope, so you can replace all anonymous error, error classes with lambdas. I've I've tried it. Mm. It looks for the whole. It looks through the whole project. I think with okay. Control shift a or something. So the next item on the list is uh, talking about an RX video you saw, RX Java 2. <coughs> yeah, so I went back and I watched um, an RX Java 2 video from our friend Jake Wharton. Mm. And I will post it on the, on, on, the, on the YouTube page. And I went through that and it looks like we sh there's really a certain way that we should try and do our RX Java code. And I think we should try and concentrate on doing it that way in this video. All right. So this is now going to move over into a bit more like how it should be done on Android. Yeah. For our example. So you know how I use subscribe, for example? Yeah. That is how it was done in RX Java 1. But in his video, he talked about a different method called subscribe with, which returns something called a disposable consumer. Um, so I thought we should. Uh, just oh, that this. that means from its name, it means that this consumer that you created here, this object is not handled later on in our code in our old code. An object is created to consume, and then it's ignored. No one takes care of disposing it. Correct. Oh. And so that might lead to a leak. So what we should really be doing is. We have this subscribe method here, and we have a listener, right? So this thing is listening, right? Yeah. This part of the code is listening for events coming in. Yeah. Yeah? So what happens to this thing here? So essentially, what we should be doing is moving to a model where you know we explicitly say, right, get rid of this when it needs to be got rid of. So um, I thought we should 
talk a bit more about the API here because there's a couple of interesting things. You see this, this, let's just go to subscribe with. So he's saying we should do use something like this. Oh, it's all just uh, prepended with the word disposable. So the same single observer you had or consumer. Okay. Did we, did we go with a single in the end? No, we went we with consumer. No, what I mean is the, the books repository is returning a single. Oh, it returns a single. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so this yeah, returns yeah. a disposable single observer, which makes sense, right? Yeah. Okay. And the other thing is, can you see I'm using the ID to help me with everything, mm. right? That's how I learn a new API. Now, interesting thing here is, if you notice, there's only one class. There's not two. There were two back there? There were two methods? There were two there were, no, there, was no, there were two classes, two with both called accept. Uh, no, there was, what there was, was, uh, let me just go back, I'll show you what there was. So here, what we had, was we had a subscribe method that took two parameters. Yeah, and another class. And, yeah. This one. So, <clears throat> what I'm saying is that, what he was saying, well, what I'm saying is that now we do something like this, disposable single observable. Now we only have one class that we're providing, right? Yeah. Now, this brings us full circle back to the beginning of the videos when you first initially said that you weren't quite sure about this whole thing to do with interfaces. Hmm. Now. For the sake of argument, let's assume this is an interface, it's actually an abstract class, which is very similar to an interface. Yeah. Right? Except that some of the methods have, have been filled in for you, yeah. have definitions, but you still can't new one of these things up, right? Without providing the other bits that it needs, right? So yeah. you've still got to provide your own class, right? Yeah. So coming back to interfaces, do you remember? So the, the authors of RxJava. Yeah don't know anything about your code. That's true. Right. right. So what they say is... Look, they do now, because <laughs> one of them talked to us on YouTube. <laughs> That's true. And we should say hi. Hi to him. Thanks for watching. Um, so essentially, the idea is that they create this... We'll call it an interface. I know it's an abstract class, but it's it doesn't really matter. The point is, they'll create this thing for us. Yeah. And then they expect us to fill in these things, because they can't know what we intend to do with the data. Mm. But they wrote a framework where they know that they want us to provide an object that obeys this contract of having these two methods on it so that they can call these methods and then leave it to us what we do with the result. I've done and something that like power, that. And that is the power of interfaces and abstract classes. Mm. So I think that might be a good way of explaining them again just for you. Yeah. Now. So this this is actually quite straightforward now. If you look at this one, it says basically, what do you want to do when everything works fine and you get a list of books, right? Whether it's zero or many, it doesn't matter. Mm. But basically, the process of going and get talking to the database and getting getting uh, some books or not, as long as it doesn't blow up, right? Yeah, will come here, and here is where it will go if it blew up because it couldn't talk to the database or something else happened, right? Yeah. So this is quite nice. So then what we can do is we can just in here say also the same thing, right? We can view say view. Dot. No, we have to check, don't we? We have to check how oh, the yeah. size of our book list, right? This yeah. is what we used to do, right? If book list dot is empty, then we say view dot display no books. Else we have books, right? Hmm. View dot Display books with the list. Otherwise, display error. Otherwise, view dot display error. Ah, see, now you can uh, feed it the uh, throwable statement from here. Very cool. I can. I can. But we already discussed how yeah, yeah. in this exercise, who cares, right? Because mm. the user's not going to know much about low-level internals about the database not working, right? Yeah. They just want to know something went wrong. But absolutely, you can. You can put it to your log system. You can make it talk to Crashlytics. You can do all these things, right? Mm. Right. question now is, though, that we've changed this code. What about our presenter? 
doesn't uh, matter. A test. A a test. test. Let's Does, see what happens when we run that. Doesn't shouldn't matter. Well, let's see. Have you ever played with code coverage at all? Oh, I hear a lot about you have sh you should have eighty percent coverage. I don't really. I'm not really sure is, what is, code coverage means. I will show you. I will show you. Um, it's a way of <coughs> testing or something. So, hold on. Let's just make sure this all works right now. I want to make I, bingo. I want to say something really, really important here, right? And this is really critical because I see so many people writing this on the internet. And it just shows you that they haven't really understood what they should be doing, right? How they should be designing their tests, right? Okay. Now, we changed production code, didn't we? Yes. Right? We, we changed code that is live. From subscribe to subscribe with. We gave it this new class, whatever, 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 right? My point is that the test still passed. The reason the test passed is because it treats our presenter as a black box. Of course. It doesn't know how it does the job. All it knows is if I give you this thing, I expect you to output this thing. Right? These view methods are called. It doesn't care whether you used Rx. It doesn't care how you used Rx. Mm. It's irrelevant, right? It doesn't matter. Now, if you design your test properly, then what you've done here is you've basically written a a test that tests the contract of the component that you're testing to make sure it does what you want it to do without caring about the internals, which means that you're free to change the internals, refactor the internals to be more efficient or read better or whatever it is Just without make, breaking yeah, yeah. what it should be doing. Even right? this, this has nothing to do with the presenter, basically. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it, you, I mean, when you when you're saying when books repository get books, then return a single just of many. This mm -hmm. line specifically has no it doesn't it isn't aware of uh, what's happening inside the uh, the load presenter. books. Yeah, the presenter. As right. long as as long as you just make it function and not have the function itself load books fail, not the stuff inside it fail. This I mean. As long as you're returning what you should be returning, this should be fine. As yeah, long as inside there you break the contract. <laughs> as you don't break yeah. the contract, it's still going to work, regardless of how you did it. You can go back to the old way of returning books. doesn't care. So, <clears throat> when we started writing these tests, was to do it, try and do it TDD. Yeah. It was a bit difficult because, um, you know, TDD means that you're writing... Um, Test first, and then you're writing production code. But we already had some production code, didn't we? But we wrote a presenter from scratch, so it still still applies. We TDD'd our presenter, and and when you do TDD, um, it's a three-step process: red, green, refactor. Mm. Red means that you've written the test, and it should fail because you haven't written the production code that passes it, so you should see red. Then you work towards making the test go green, which basically means write the production code. And you should write the production code as simply as it needs to be to get the job done. Don't mm. complicate it. Just think about that one test for the time being and get it to get, get green. And then you can go back and you can refactor it to like, you know, maybe use proper, you know, like more readable or something. Maybe you just made a whole bundle of code in a long method. Now you want to break it out. Mm. Yeah. So you, you just keep following that principle. And I think a, a, the reason a lot of people complain about tests and the problems they have with tests is they'll say, oh, well, I was refactoring code and all my tests have to be rewritten. Well, the only reason your test should need to be rewritten is if the contracts change. Exactly. So that's what I was going to say. It's a battle of constantly having to decide who gets the upper hand. Should you follow the test or should the test follow the code? You're always like in this scenario. This this should be your guideline as to how you should write the code, not the other way around. Correct. Correct. You know, you should so follow this guy. Point. So this guy shouldn't change. No, it shouldn't have to change. It shouldn't right? have Unless to change. You changed the yeah. contracts between the requirements the parties, right? change. Yeah. 
but it takes a lot of experience before you get there. I mean, even even I was making these mistakes in the early days. Is I was thinking I had to make sure every single line of code in 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 the class I'm testing, you know, was, you know, I I know what it was doing. When the the reality is no, you need to you need to step back a little bit, and at a high level state what the test should have tried to accomplish. Right. Mm. So like I said, we've just rewritten some of the presenter Rx code. And our test still passed because it still does what we want it to do, but in a slightly different way. All and right. We should try and aim to do that for all our tests. All right. Now, I promised you a bit of code coverage. Now, there's another button up here. Mm. Run books, okay. present a test with coverage. Does it going to say 100%? I don't know oh, no, no, no. I, I don't know. I don't know what it'll say. We'll see, right? Actually, I've never pressed that button on your project before. Let's hope it works. Okay, it worked. Now... Oh, things happened. Oh, you're looking. Uh, you know, you know what this means, though. This is your whole project, yep. and you have one percent coverage. That's amazing. At least uh, every every journey starts with a step. <laughs> but <laughs> exactly. Actually, but here it's a hundred percent. Actually, that's a very good point, and maybe some people who are um, inspired to start testing their apps. They could do what I did on my first project, right? What I did is I joined this Android project and they had no tests, but they did have CI, right? They used Jenkins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, they were using it basically, you know, every time you do a commit, it would build the app, you know, and pr produce APKs, right? Mm. But what it should be doing is running your tests and then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but anyway, I got there and I said, look, we've got to start introducing testing, right? And so what I did was. There's a plugin for Jenkins. Hmm. It's a code coverage plugin. I don't remember its exact name, but you know, have a look. There's not many, right? Hmm. And essentially, it gave you a graph on the home page of the project, and it started right at the bottom. And you could see over time as the number of tests started to increase. Yeah. So I know we've got one percent here, but like we carry on like this. Give it a few weeks, it'll start going up and up. And it was so good to see that graph just going up and up and up and up. Nice. Now. I don't want to get too much into code coverage because it's a bit of a big topic. But it's just a. Anyway, uh, I'll just explain to you yeah. how it works, what it does. Now, can you see in our presenter, you've got these lines here? Hmm. These lines. Oh, wait, what? The lines what? that are highlighted, like these, these guys? These green lines, these green lines here. Oh, I thought the line numbers. Oh, okay. No, no, next to the line number. I thought they were a UI issue, man. <laughs> I <No>. swear. <laughs> no. Like some bug with the with the visual interface. No, no, no. Essentially, they are telling you the lines that are covered by your test. Cool. It doesn't tell you that you tested what the line does. It's just telling you that when I ran your tests, I went to these lines. Fine, remove one of those lines in the view display box. What will happen? What do you mean? No, no, that's not what I mean. What How I can mean you is, make... For example, yeah, yeah, I'll show you. Hmm, no lines. Yeah, now watch. Now I'll run it again. Oh, by the way, look, you can see 100% there as well next to the... Presenter. Oh, yeah. So that. That every line was visited. Oh, it's mentioned here. It's mentioned in the project view. Yeah, it is. Look. Well, I never saw that before. Oh, well, only if you... Oh, because you ran code run. coverage yeah. once. Okay. Right. Now, let's have a look. Now, what's happened? Now, let's forget about this one. That, that That's for the project project-wide stuff. Yeah. Look at this. It's changed. Yeah. And it's gone down, right? It's gone down, it's yeah. Because there's one right. method that's untested. And if you have a look, it's red. Yeah. Which means this has not been tested. So what you can do is as you're going through the process of like adding tests to an existing project, you can use this to find out what you've covered and what you haven't covered and make a judgment mm. call about whether it's worth covering the stuff mm. that you haven't got tested. So if you go over there and now write a test called uh, test do nothing and you call the do nothing method from the presenter, yeah, it so if will I, go for example, green? 
If I do this... Oh, you include it in another test. Well, you've got to call it. From right? somewhere. From somewhere. That's the whole point, right? It needs to be included as part of your test run. Um, yeah, but we're in the presenter here. But the method's in the presenter too. Yeah, but that yeah. doesn't mean you wrote the test for it. You're sitting exactly. in the presenter now. But that's, but that's the important point. The important point is it doesn't tell you whether what it does works or not. It just tells you that it actually went to that line. So now... It went to that line, okay. To 100%. Correct? Mm. Code coverage? Do you mean uh, if all the methods in the universe are tested or not? Or if all the methods are being called... No, there's, a, there's an important distinction here, okay? You know our tests... Okay, actually, this is a good one to, to mention now, okay? This, this, is is where you should, this is where you should call the do-nothing, so that it would say no. this is covered. No, 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 no. The important thing is you can write a test... Okay, watch this. Oh, it is covered by someone calling it. Yeah, yeah, okay. But it doesn't know whether what it does... Yeah, yeah, yeah is right or wrong it that's just tells true. you i went to this line and ran some code that's true okay that's its function okay to go so, somewhere yeah. and check this method okay. right which leads me on to the other point some projects uh, luckily i haven't worked on these projects but so I've it's a bullshit number money. man some projects say you must have 100 percent code coverage yeah okay and people struggle to do that because some things are really difficult to, to test and some things are pointless to test like getters and setters, right? But they still, you know, because they, unfortunately, they work somewhere that they don't really think about these things. They say, you know, you've got, we want 100% code coverage. And so what you can do is you can write a test that just calls, that calls it. your code but doesn't check anything. Exactly. It's bullshit. But because, yeah, and it's complete bullshit. Yeah. Complete bullshit. Here's a hundred percent. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. So can we I just say to my listeners out there, if you ever end up working in a place where they say we want a hundred percent code coverage, run. Yeah. Just run. Okay. You have to be smart about these things. You have to use the information that it gives you properly. Okay. Because it's up to you to be the smart person, right? It's up to you to decide how to test your code and what it means to test your code. Mm. Don't rely on these things. I mean, this is useful information. It tells me that, you know, the presenter that we wrote has some good coverage, right? It's not about being 100% or not. What matters is, is the important stuff in the presenter covered with tests? Hmm. And also, don't forget, you know, we've got an if here. We've got an if. That's statement true. Here. So there and might be one of them. Yeah, what if, you know, ooh, actually, that's a good one to do. Actually. Some Let's see One of them might not be called. Like this one. <laughs> It's going to say that line is not called the no books. Well, let's see. Let's see. Because think about it with the variable initialization. If you do that and there's a chance that this variable might not be initialized based on an if, it's going to tell you uninitialized. It's not going to compile. Okay, let's have a look. You see, it was good enough to tell you you're missing a test for that condition. Yeah, the compiler now, can do that. Mm. Well, no, it wasn't the compiler, it was runtime. Yeah, I know, but if the compiler can do that, then the same logic applies here. For yeah, but The compiler can't do it because the tests are runtime, right? So That's that won't true. happen, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so this is useful because the situation we're in with legacy code, right? We have some existing code, we need to write tests for it. And, you know, we were fortunate here that we created a brand new class and started testing it. But sometimes you might not be able to do that and you've got to somehow work out how to test an existing class in place. So if you can actually get it into a situation where you can write a unit test against it, then you can use the coverage to find out which lines are being covered. And then if you see that, oh, look, we missed a test case for this one, then you can add it in. Mm -hmm. So it has a place, but I thought I'd mention it for the time being. By the way, um, look, look over here. It says uh, on the project view, on the right, it says books activity present 100% methods, but 93% mm -hmm. lines. Yes. So it goes through the methods, but not the lines. 
that all the methods in the project are, are covered, but some lines in those methods are not. So it's right. very specific. It's very specific. So use this for information to help you work out what tests to write. But be very, very, very wary if you're in a project where it's being used by managers, because that's the worst thing. Because this thing isn't perfect, and you have to think about it. Yeah. But it's, it's good. I like it. Cool. So anyway, so where were we? Um, let's put our test back to where it was. And there we are. Now, so we were, we were talking about the subscribe with yeah. and how it it comes with these quite nice methods already in there that serve to do everything we want to do. Yeah, now we want to dispose of this guy. But before we do that, can I just have another look at this method? Oh, it just takes one of these things. Oh, okay. Now, this returns something. Mm. Yeah, the object. The disposables. No. List observe disposable. That's what it returns, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Now. Can you go full screen? I can go full screen or just get rid of the other windows? I uh, just want to see more code, yeah. <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, the big issue we have as Android developers. Mm. The big issue we have is life cycle. Yeah. Complicates everything. It's pretty hard to cover everything that we need to think about and know that we have. But in our case here, we've written this code. We created this object called a disposable single observer. It has a reference to the view. It talks to the view. The view is in the outside class, which is in the presenter. Which is so in these the act things are activity. Which which is also linked to the activity, right? So now we have a situation where this might end up causing a memory leak yeah. if we're not careful. Okay? Okay. So they obviously thought about this and they gave you this thing. I thought there would be some method that would go over all the people, all the objects who are listening, who are subscribed and unregister them manually, uh, automatically from their end. Why would I have to keep a reference if that's what you're going to say to the object that's subscribing and then keep after it? And it's like Objective-C is a pool, object pool. I don't know enough about objects. Objective-C. Where you have to keep track of the objects that you allocated, so you have to dump them in the end. Go on. And yeah, so it's a similar idea, right? But the point is that, you know, if you create these observers, you need to make sure that they get cleared at the right time. Mm. So that means that we need to think about when is the right time. Shouldn't it be automatic though? How would it know when to do it? How would you register? We tell that we we can we can tell the, we can tell it for in a situation in a scenario like on destroy. Uh, hey RX, go and check all of your subscribers and stop them from subscribing. Whoever is right. subscribed, dump them. <clears throat> right. So what what we're talking about is we need to hook up something from. We need some method in here, hmm. and uh, we need the activity to call it at the right time to say, "Look, I'm done with you." Here. And then it can do clean up, right? Yeah. A getter, here. a getter that would provide this object. No, no, no. Not a getter. Not a getter. An instruction to the presenter. That I've, I'm done with you, clear mm -hmm. yourself up. Right? Okay. So it could be a void method, right? Because what's the activity going to do with the information? Nothing. It's about to die, right? Fine. Okay. So the pattern is this, right? So you introduce something called a. It's called a composite disposable. Okay, this is how people are solving this problem. I didn't come up with it. Okay, so you create this class to hold your disposables. Okay. So what we can do is we can actually 
we don't really need the reference to it itself. What no. we can do is we can just say this. We can do. Oh, so disposable is a type of, is a is a class from uh, is a child of composite. I don't know if it's a child. No. It's oh, you said child. add. Okay. So what you're saying is this thing holds yeah, yeah. multiple things, yeah. holds multiple disposables of different so types. There you go. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Because composite. Yeah, should be able to deal with you know singles, maybe's, completables, all the stuff, all that stuff we care about. Uh -huh. So now what happens is. Um, we add it to that, mm -hmm. and so now the composite disposable knows all about it, and now we need some way of clearing it, right? Okay. So if we add another method here and call it unsubscribe, mm -hmm. C, you need. You're missing a C. Oh, thank you. Spelling is not greatest. No. It's oh, unused. Yeah. That's it. Okay. And then the method on it is called compost set disposable. Not dispose. Dot. Well. I don't think it's clear apparently. because I think this guy is an array list of type T. They should call dispose. Just going to put that out there. Out of nothing, head cannon. So, <laughs> so you made that up. Yes, you completely made that up. Yes, right. It's a head um, cannon. <laughs> when I want to say something that sounds true but is only to me, let me see. There we go. Oh, it calls dispose on its own. You shouldn't call dispose. I think then. Dispose is on the individual one. Hmm. Oh. The whole point of this, this bigger class is that it manages that for you. All Atomically you clears and disposes all previous contents. Very nice. Where did you, know, you learn all this? <laughs> Watching the videos. Okay. And actually, you end up having to do this in the real world with Rx. Because there is this, the, it's called composite subscription in Rx for Java 1. Ooh. Did the, yes. uh, w would, would using Leak Canary co I catch this? Maybe. Yeah, maybe it depends you, you a lot used on what it? was. I have used it. Mixed results. Mm. Turns out there are a lot of bugs in the Android SDK as well. Mm. <laughs> Which is a bit also it's going to catch stuff that doesn't concern you. Yeah, um, but it all depends on what's going on in here, right? Mm. Yeah. Anyway, so now we've got this method, and here's the, here's the weird thing: should we test it or not? It's not yours. You don't test it. Well, I think it's pointless testing this, really. Yeah. And you know what a lot of people do, right? Is that this sort of boilerplate stuff just gets in the way of what's really important, which is this stuff, right? Mm. So what you can do is you can create a base class for presenters. Exactly, because you're going to put this in all presenters? Yeah, ideally, yeah. If, you, if you're going to go down Rx route, yeah. No, absolutely. you have to put it in some one place, I mean. One presenter class, they all extend from it. Yeah, so you create a super class, you can create this there, you can um, have nice methods for adding these. Uh, to yeah, yeah, add to add to composite, add to composite object, and you remove. Don't have to worry about calling this here; it'll be handled in the super class. But yeah, as long as you call the methods appropriately from the activity. Yeah, you can have in your base activity also. A view uh, a presenter object, which in the on destroy of that base activity calls this unsubscribe on your behalf. What you would do is yes, yes, you would have the base presenter uh, would have a method which is unsubscribe on it, and your activity would call it. Mm. So you wouldn't see it at this level. You see, it, so in the super class, it will deal with it for you. Okay. Yeah, so that that's common, and I think if we hit another presenter, we should definitely do that. Okay. Okay, but the point is, is it worth testing? I don't think it's worth testing because again, this is just boilerplate stuff, and it could become part of our base presenter, and I I don't think testing it really adds any value. Yeah. It's not interesting stuff, right? You write it, either works or it doesn't work. It's true. Why would you touch it again? I don't think we'd even touch it again. We wouldn't need to change it. No, this so one, you really just place it and hope it works. Yeah. 
So what we need to do is we need to... You can go to the base activity. Oh, there's an on destroy here already. Oh, we said we want to do it in on stop. I think on stop will be the one. I, I was reading, maybe you can tell me differently, but I was reading somewhere that you can't rely on on destroy anymore. It might not get called. Is that true? Head cannon. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I think that's a Google search. But anyway, you haven't overridden on stop here. No, no on stop here. But there is one in base activity. Go to base activity. Yes, but we can't do it here because the base activity doesn't know oh, about does... our presenter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, this is too high up the tree. Okay. Up the tree. At the moment. Yeah, the inheritance. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right? So only this class at the moment knows there's a presenter to have a method called on it, right? Okay. Uh, so it needs to be in here for the time being. And again, maybe hand in hand with the presenter base class, we'll have an activity base class. Well, you have one, right? And it could do this sort of stuff for us see, automatically, so we don't have to do it in every new activity. See all these uh, anonymous inner classes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're all offered to change. So I'm going to do that offline. I'm going to change mm -hmm. all the anonymous inner classes to to lambdas. Okay, that's not a problem. Okay, so where's the best place to put on stop? Okay, you've got on pause here. Yeah, on destroy. just after that. You know, in my recent projects now, I don't. I'm looking at this code. Yeah, I don't usually just uh, ramble on with methods uh, arbitrarily in a uh, random order. I just put all the overrides in one section, and then I put the custom stuff which I've written, the functions I made in another place, like mm -hmm. order inside the one file. You know. Now they're all just all over the place. Right. Now, by the way, because we, we made a decision not to test that side of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. That means that our code coverage count is going to go down. That's true. Which it's false why, positive. Which is why, you know, aiming for 100% doesn't always make sense, right? What we care about is, is this stuff tested, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I just thought I'd introduce that as the pattern that's very common in, th in real world apps, <clears throat> you know? Yeah, but I think there would be uh, a singleton provided by the application called the composite disposable if this is the case that you're talking about oh you know what but it shouldn't be a singleton it shouldn't be a singleton because these um, these subscribers are based on uh, acti per activity so right. per presenter so per destroy it's not the <laughs> whole application that died you can have a memory leak from one application, uh, from one activity going off. I mean, every logical screen in your app, you know, can cause a memory a leak. Maybe it's around a fragment. Maybe it's around a custom view group. Um, you know, you need to work out the scope of what you're doing. And mm. I mean, a lot of people are using logical screens, which would make sense, right? Here's a logical screen in my app. Mm. Okay. That's the scope that you're interested in. So then that's the scope of the composite disposable. What makes sense to do at that point? Because, you know, it shouldn't really, that composite disposable shouldn't really have you have any references to stuff outside the current Because <laughs> they're defeating the purpose. <laughs> then yeah. the composite disposable will cause a memory leak. Yeah. And also, you know, this thing is going gonna, gonna to clear all of them, right? Yeah, yeah. It's going to clear all of them. Uh, yeah, all of the ones that are sitting in this object. Exactly, yeah. Mm. So, I mean, the chances are, you know, if you reuse the same composite in another screen, let's say you use Dagger and you made it global. Then you, right? you unsubscribe people who are supposed to still be subscribing. No, it's very unlikely that you're going to leave anybody in there when you move to a new screen. Very unlikely, because all these disposables are really tied to this specific screen. So what I'm saying is that you could create this once and keep reusing it. Mm -hmm. That's just not a good idea, because you might screw up at some point and forget to clean it up as you reuse it. I see. So just create a new one. It's not, <laughs> okay. it's not a big deal, right? Just create a new one. I'm pretty much your sure optimization is the root of all evil. It is, yes. So anyway, I wanted to introduce that as well. And what else have we got on here? You want to take uh, the DB call off the main thread? Not yet. Okay. I think we need to talk about that last. So 
we're at uh, 47 minutes now. Okay, I think, yeah, let's, let's just cover a couple of little things. Okay. Now, do you remember the first time that we added this RxD stuff, you were trying to do assignment and it didn't work? Assignment? Yeah, you were just taking the existing code we had that didn't have any Rx in there and you were trying to make a variable equal the call to the books repository dot get books. You've probably forgotten by now. Yeah. But anyway, my point was more along the lines of now that we've entered this world of Rx. You can still do that. You just did it with the composite disposable. You assigned basically an object which is returned by this whole block from 23 to 35 to an, to an array list. When, when we enter the reactive world, there's this thing that they say about how, why, why do they say it's better, right? Now, this is what they say. This is the textbook stuff, right? Hmm. They say because you shouldn't change the data that you're working with. Hmm. Because if you're always working with things such as our list of books, right? We don't change our list of books if you look. We get we go and get it, and then we send it to the UI. But we didn't uh, change its values or anything. Yeah, you shouldn't do that. Right. And they say that if you, as long as every object that you're dealing with, every data object that you're dealing with, doesn't need to change, then it becomes a lot easier in the long run to think about it and not worry about, you know, oh, okay, so it started looking like this, and then the next thing, somebody called a method and made it change the field to this. Mm -hmm. If you don't have to worry about that stuff, then it should be easier. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what they say. So that's something we should be aware of. So let's say, for example, that instead of sending the book list to the view layer, right? Okay. This one here, as it is coming in, we want to change it into another list perhaps, or some other object, then the idea is that you don't adjust the original one, you create the new one. You're not adjusting. Yes, I'm not here. There's no, there's, you know, we're just taking what we're given and we're sending it to the UI. Yeah. But I'm just saying that, you know, the thing is, the power, okay, there's three parts to the Rx Java stuff. There's something that generates events which is this call here. Yeah. That generates events, right? Mm -hmm. Classes representing source of data hmm. is this thing here. Oh, look, we can get rid of this as well. Look. Hmm. Nice. Nice. So we got that. This is where our data comes from. Mm. Okay. This class here represents a class that consumes the data, listens for it, and does something with it. Yeah. Okay? And then the third part of RxJava is that we can play with it. We have operators such as flat map or map or there's so many operators. So essentially what it's saying is that, oh, okay, you got this data just now. Now I want you to change it into this, then change it into that, then do this, then do that. And then all this, all the stuff, you know, um, there's a load of stuff there that we might be interested in doing as well. And there, that's where the power is. It's like something comes in and then it comes into this pipeline before finally being pushed out. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if we can do more of our code in this way, it should be a lot easier to think about. You sent this one thing in and then you got this one thing out. Now, that's the, that's the theory. And a lot of people love that stuff. So it's definitely the way things are going. So, you know, that's how that's how functional programming looks like from the higher perspective. Absolutely. You got does, like yeah. a bunch of black boxes that n none care about what the other is doing uh, as long yes. as each of them does what it should. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, we'll have to see how we go. I think that pretty much covers everything I wanted to talk about with regard to Rx Java 2 right now. Mm. Uh, the thing about coming off the main thread right mm -hmm. now, coming yeah, going going on to a background there, coming back onto a main thread, we should leave for the next video because then we have to introduce testing and that introduces a whole lot of new stuff. So, so um, we do that next time? yeah, next time we can do that. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, mm -hmm. uh, I haven't gotten the time yet to sit down and consume this whole uh, project and how it's been changing as you've been working on it with me. So I'm going to do that very soon and we might have a little section at the beginning of the next episode 
some 5 to 10 minutes just refreshing if I have any questions about what we already did right now because it seems like uh, it's a lot to take in you know and I've been a getting huh? a recap session a recap session something like that yeah to oh, I think that's a very good idea and I think we should throw it out there to our listeners and viewers to yeah add so it. people who are coming in for example at the sixth episode no idea what's going on how we got there and probably that's the episode that we're gonna um, I'll, I'll, I'll see how I can release some code specifically specifically code that has to do because we're getting requests that we should share the code and uh, this is not open source so we can I think we can manage to share the code that has to do with the stuff that we changed maybe a before and after there's already on git some history we can do something like that or at least share the current code because it hasn't like morphed new stuff was added but not man many things changed in their like uh, they didn't change in their being the stuff was added and then only the activity m might have changed so that's what we might do Okay, well, I hope that was useful to everyone. Please do give us lots of uh, feedback uh, on the YouTube channel. And I uh, hope to see you next time. See you next time, guys. Goodbye. Bye.